Thanks so much for being here today. Um, as was just mentioned, my name is Julie Pace. I'm the Washington Bureau Chief for the Associated Press, uh, which puts me in charge of AP's campaign coverage, but also some of the really unique things that AP does during a presidential election, which is calling uh, races, counting delegates, um, and really giving uh, people a real sense of um, who's actually going to win this race. Uh, I'm really happy to be joined by Jeff Berman. Um, one of the things that we're going to be talking about today is, you know, you'll hear a lot about uh, candidates and, and coverage and themes, but ultimately, this comes down to the primary calendar, the voters that are going to caucuses and primaries, and the results of those uh, of those uh, contests. And Jeff is the perfect person to be walking us through um, the logistics of this, because as is the case with a lot of things in politics, it's actually a lot more complicated than it looks. Jeff was the delegate director for Barack Obama's 2008 campaign. He also uh, was an advisor to Hillary Clinton's 2016 effort. And he's been uh, a member of the DNC working on the Important Rules Committee and was part of the process in 2017 uh, of reevaluating this whole process. So he'll be able to give us some really great insights into what's different this time around. Uh, and then after Jeff's finished with his presentation, I'll talk a little bit about um, how you can take the information that Jeff is is giving us and, and really inform your coverage and, and, and cover the, the delegate process, particularly in the, del in the Democratic primary, uh, in a really smart and informed way, and then we'd be happy to take your questions. So with that, I will turn it over to Jeff. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna step over here. Uh, since this is not so much a panel, it's really kind of a little more like a lecture but uh, bear with me. Uh, I'm going to try and give you as much information as I can. Um, and I'm, we have a few slides. And um, I'm going to do this in four sections. First, I'm going to talk about the basic structure of the system. Then some sort of strategy and things to think about once we've discussed the system. Then we're going to look at the primary and caucus calendar. We're going to see how it compares to the recent competitive cycles. And then the last part will be taking a look at the Democratic-sponsored debates. And um, so let's see if we can get this. Oh, let me uh, move forward, and then we're going to, OK. So um, now I, don't, I, I saw before that we have people here who've uh, followed uh, the recent campaign cycles, and some, some folks are new. So I'm going to try and cover uh, the basics here. There's over 50 primaries and caucuses because the territories also have contests. And so, uh, as you know, we start with the four early states. And those are Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, and South Carolina. Those were picked originally. It was sort of Iowa and New Hampshire. And then a few cycles ago, we added Nevada and South Carolina. The Republicans and the Democrats are in agreement that these four early states, they go first. After that, the window opens and the states, the state Democratic parties and legislatures can choose any date they want all the way through June. And so um, what you have then is we're going to have a total of 3,768 delegates. Now, those delegates, they're allocated to each of the states according to a formula that we have that takes into account population and democratic voting strength. That number is going to change because over the summer, we're going to be adding delegates for states that start their primaries or caucuses on April 1 or later. And we do this as a party to encourage states to spread out and not all uh, clump up at the front. And so uh, now a lot of states don't take advantage of those bonuses, but some states do. In the summer, they'll be allocated those bonuses. The 3768 number is going to increase, and the magic number, which is 50% plus one, will also go up at that time. It'll be around 2,000. Um, so the other thing is, of course, we have the 763 automatic delegates. Some of you know them as superdelegates. Uh, the rules have changed for those delegates. Um, in most, uh, mostly in this modern era, we've had superdelegates, and they were free to vote for any presidential candidate they wanted, no matter what the primary or caucus result in their home state. We've changed that rule for the first time in 2020. And so for 2020, 
those delegates will all be still delegates to the National Convention, but on the first ballot, they won't vote. So that the first ballot is only the delegates that have been elected through the primaries and caucuses. And so what that means, by the way, is in the event we go beyond one ballot, if there is no majority on the first ballot, the electorate at the convention will be different on the second ballot because then the 763 automatic delegates will enter the voting. Um, the, uh, the delegates that each state gets are divided up so that 75% of them are assigned by district. In almost all states, that's the congressional district, but in some states, they're actually allocated by state senate district or even a district that the state makes up for that purpose. But it's in a, a plan, and uh, everyone will know how that's going to be done. Um, and then the remaining 25% of the delegates for that state are elected on a statewide basis. And so what that means in a, uh, in a contest where, say, you have four districts, you're really looking at five separate elections, right? Because uh, in each of the districts, say there's five delegates to be elected, those delegates will be allocated to the presidential candidates based only on the vote in that district. So you're actually competing then in five elections in that state with four CDs, just to keep that in mind. There is a 15% threshold. You need, a candidate needs at least 15% of the vote to get any delegates, okay? 14 doesn't cut it. No delegates. Uh, and that applies at the district level and the statewide. And uh, in the Democratic Party, we allocate delegates only proportionally. You'll hear winner take all, this or that. Any of that stuff is on the Republican side. The Democrats haven't used those systems in years. Strict proportionality. Okay? Um, the last thing I'll say is the delegates themselves are uh, selected locally in the state, but the presidential candidates, there is a process by which the presidential candidates can approve who serves as their delegates. The delegates technically are not legally bound to vote for the candidate uh, for whom they're a delegate. Uh, the rule that we have as a Democratic Party is that you should cast the vote uh, in all good conscience uh, to reflect the sentiments of those who elected you, which basically means stick with your candidate. If, however, some circumstances change, you're not legally bound uh, to stay with that candidate. But the presidential candidates have the right to approve who their delegates are so they can sort of work that way to assure loyalty. All right. Um, OK, next is the strategy points. So I just want to go over these quickly. A lot of this is going to be kind of common sense or familiar to you. Uh, the field of candidates, we have an incredible size field uh, for 2020. Uh, but there is a process that goes on before the voting begins. People call it the shadow primary. You can call it whatever you want. But uh, the polls, the money raised, the debate performances, anything else that arises during the uh, campaign this calendar year will uh, have a, uh, an effect on the voters and, and which candidates they see as within the mix, truly, when the voting begins. Um, momentum, of course, is key. Uh, everyone knows the story of President Giuliani. Uh, a couple cycles ago, he decided to not start at the very first vote in Iowa. He was going to wait till Florida. By the time Florida came, other candidates had momentum. It's very hard to start late. So, um, and, and the other thing is that uh, it's a serial process. So one, winning begets winning. And if you're not winning, it's hard to start winning. And if you are winning, uh, you better keep winning. And that's kind of how, how it works. Um, Iowa, which is the first state to vote in the past, no more than three candidates in modern times have broken the 15% threshold uh, in the Iowa caucuses. This time, for the first time ever, we are going to be um, having a raw vote total in the caucus states. This is by a new national party rule. In the past, Iowa only reported how many delegates the candidates won. Now they're going to also report the raw vote. So maybe if somebody 
gets 14% of the vote, uh, that might be uh, enough to move on and say that they, they met uh, their goal. In the past, they would have had zero delegates. Uh, in this case, they'll still have zero delegates, mind you, but at least you will know what their vote total was. In the past, that vote was not uh, counted released. Um, another change, the National Party is mandating absentee voting for the first time. And um, this is within the caucus states. So uh, the typical Iowa caucus, everyone shows up at the same time, divides up. If you're not there at that time, you're not in the caucus. For the first time, there is going to be a mechanism in the caucus states for people to uh, vote early, either in person or electronically. They're developing new mechanisms. We're going to see those for the first time. Um, let's see. Uh, there's going to be f far fewer caucuses than what we were used to. In 2008, when I was running the delegate operation for Obama, caucuses were a key part of our strategy. We really outperformed in them. Uh, a lot of the major caucus states are switching over to primaries, so the caucus process will be less of a factor. Of course, Iowa and Nevada are still definitely remaining as, as pure caucuses. Um, so uh, early voting, OK, we, we all know that early voting has been a trend that's every election cycle, more states are having early voting. And the early voting is, is uh, earlier when it begins. We had early voting in 08. I was, people talk about California being back up in the front of the calendar on Super Tuesday. We had Super Tuesday California with early voting in 2008. So it's not the first time. So early voting can be very important, but in the past it was not decisive. Um, every election cycle is different. You know, we're going to go to the calendar now, and with the calendar, you're going to see uh, there are changes every four years, and, and the rules are different. Like I've already mentioned, we've changed some of the caucus rules, the superdelegate rule. Uh, so every cycle is different. Um, Obviously, Associated Press and others are, are going to keep a running delegate count, and that's going to kind of keep a tally for everyone. Uh, if three or more candidates survive beyond Super Tuesday, you know, you got to get to 51%. And the more candidates that are keeping a share of delegates and going forward, it gets harder and harder for others, for any, to get to the 51%. That's where you got to get to. Um, well, uh, so all of the candidates are going to have different appeal, different kinds of appeal. So, it, you know, we're going to have to see how many of these candidates can stay in the race into the, well into the primaries. Uh, and then, of course, the national convention in Milwaukee uh, in July. We have not had a contested contest in a long time uh, at a convention. It just hasn't been the case. Uh, and we know, but of course, we now have way more candidates. But in the past, it's always winnowed down. So uh, take all that into consideration. Let's see if I can. All right, here's the calendar. Uh, it's familiar to a lot of you. Um, we have the four early states, Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina. You can see as a total, they have 155 delegates. Mm -hmm. Their significance is mostly in generating political momentum, showing the strength of your candidacy. It's not quite as much whether you won 12 delegates or 11 delegates in a particular state. We get to Super Tuesday, 1,457 delegates. It comes right on the heels of South Carolina. Uh, now, this looks impressive. I will tell you, in 2008, when I was doing the Obama campaign, there were 1,681 delegates on Super Tuesday. And uh, we had 23 states. And uh, here, I believe, we have uh, 16. So um, it, it, the other things I will say is there are a few. This calendar is tentative, OK? The dates have not been formally set in some of the states. In a few cases, I've indicated possible dates, uh, things, dates that I think maybe they're likely to fall. Um, you see you've got California, 416 delegates. That's less than they had in 2016, because in 2016, they were at the end of the voting order, and they got bonus delegates. Remember I said this summer states are going to get bonus delegates? They lost like 70 or 80 delegates by moving forward. Uh, they lost the bonus. 
Um, also, you'll see we got Texas, uh, 228, uh, Georgia. In Georgia, the Secretary of State will set the date of the primary, but uh, I expect it will be on Super Tuesday. Um, then we roll over, and you see the first Saturday after Super Tuesday. It's just a few days later. Uh, Louisiana and possibly a, ca a caucus in Kansas. That's when they have held it. Uh, then we go to what might be called Junior Tuesday, uh, which is the, uh, the 10th. And so you can see there 540 delegates uh, that are possible on that day. Uh, there, there are changes. The states that are in bold are for a reason because they're new to that date. So that's why I bolded them. You could sort of see from 2016 who has moved on to one of these dates. Uh, notice Oregon and Washington. Oregon, it's still in the legislature, but you see the western states moving up because usually that was more of a Michigan and Mississippi uh, date. You could see they're the only ones not bolded. And um, so there's a bunch of states moving up there. It's going to be an important day. Uh, then you see uh, the next Tuesday, a week later, three significant states, lots of delegates, another big voting day. Um, you know, there's a lots of stories about, you know, different ones of these states and how they got to where they are, but we don't have time for all of it. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, so now you're into April. Uh, something of significance, I think. You're seeing Alaska and Hawaii. So Alaska and Hawaii are actually both caucus states. There's a P and a C. I would really make it a P and a P is what I had intended because it's, they're technically caucus states, but they're going to run essentially a primary by, run by the state party, not by the state government. So um, you're, what you're going to see then, and that's new, okay, because typically they held more of a traditional caucus like Iowa. So again, it's this movement from caucuses to primaries. Even if you're still a caucus state, you might run your caucus more like a primary. And what that means, I don't want to be too complicated, but in a regular caucus, everyone shows up, divides in the room, you figure out what is the percentage of support for each candidate. In a party-run primary that's like a caucus, the voters can come, cast a secret ballot, and leave. It's just like a primary. And we call it sometimes a firehouse primary, because you might go to the firehouse to cast those uh, ballots. Um, but usually, the hours that the voting is open is shorter. Sometimes it's only four hours, because the party is running it, not the state government. And there will be far fewer voting places, because again, the party doesn't have the resources to staff a lot of places. Um, so then uh, we've got a big voting day on uh, Tuesday the 28th. Uh, that's sort of a mid-Atlantic regional contest. Those states, if they were to hold, and not all those dates are set yet, uh, they will get a bonus. So they're going to get a bonus for being in April. As I said, all of these states that fall after April 1 will get a bonus of additional delegates. And if you hold a contest with your neighbors, you get a second bonus, and you get both of the bonuses. And so you might end up, say, with 25% more delegates. You would bump their delegate number up. Uh, New York, we don't know the date yet. Uh, they set their date every four years, and the, the old date has already expired. Um, May, you'll have some more contests sort of dribbling through. And then we have a few, mostly the territories, uh, that have not yet uh, set their date. There again, you see the numbers I said before with the total the magic number, the number of automatic delegates, and the grand total and the magic number are both going to rise when the bonus delegates are allocated. Okay. The uh, last thing uh, I wanted to talk about are the debates. The debates are an important part of the structure. The Democratic Party, the DNC, is uh, running the debate system as they did last time. Uh, They've gone really out of their way to try and develop a system that they think will be fair and transparent and include the candidates and give everyone uh, an opportunity to perform. So let's see. There we go. So um, there's going to be there are 12 debates that are already planned. 
six this year, six next year. Generally, they're going to be monthly. So this is going to be like a monthly uh, performance that the whole country is going to absorb our Democratic uh, candidates uh, on the stage debating. Uh, the four early states that have their key uh, debates before the vote, they're going to be in the next calendar year in the period right in advance of uh, their contests in the four early states. Um, the first two debates will be this summer in June and July. Since there's more than 10 candidates, they're going to be on two nights. And um, that means we're going to basically, we're going to accommodate up to 20 candidates. I don't know what the current number is. I can't keep track of it. But we're getting to that number. We may even exceed it. Um, so what we're going to do, since there's two nights back to back of debates, um, we're not going to use the model the Republicans did where there was an adults and a kids table type debate, if you remember, or a first tier and, a, and then the second tier, the major league, the minor league, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're mixing the candidates up by lottery. So whether you're going to be on the first night or the second night, there'll be a lottery to determine it. Again, so everyone has a fair shot and they're not put in a setting that is second to the other setting. Um, and you can see the, the locations, Miami and Detroit. Uh, they're going to be televised. The June one is N uh, NBC, MSNBC, Telemundo. July uh, is CNN. They're both going to be streamed. There's still logistics to be worked out. The venues, the moderators, the format, logistics. Um, I mentioned the candidates being assigned randomly to the two nights. Um, eligibility is, you know, what does it take to get in our debates, the Democratic debates? There's a polling method and a grassroots fundraising method. You probably have seen this reported already. Uh, so the polling method, you have to be uh, poll at least 1% in three different polls, uh, national or in the four early states. And uh, the three polls need to be by either three different pollsters or in three different regions of the country if you're using the state polls. Uh, the fundraising method is you have to have at least 65,000 donors including 200 coming from at least 20 states, 200 per state from at least 20 states. So uh, as I said, we're going to accommodate a maximum of 20 candidates. That would be 10 per night. And the way, if we have over 20, uh, you know, you'll have to have met either both methods and we're going to work through to, till we get to 20, uh, 20 candidates uh, and breaking any ties by going, uh, meeting both methods to polling to, to the donor method. Uh, more debates will be added later. And as you know, the candidates are discouraged from competing in other debates that the Democratic Party is not uh, operating or sanctioning, um, though forums are permitted. Um, so that's an overview of the system. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure you may. Jeff could have been talking, keep going for two or three hours yeah. about this. You got so, the Cliff Notes version yes. for sure. I'm going to turn it over, back over to you. So, if you are feeling a little overwhelmed right now by the complexity of the process, don't worry. Don't freak out. Uh, this is my fourth uh, presidential cycle, and every time I hear a version of that kind of presentation, I also feel a little overwhelmed. Um, one of the things I want to talk about, though, is how uh, you will use this information as you are covering uh, the campaign as you are covering the candidates, and how much of this, frankly, you need to figure out on your own. Uh, let's talk about delegates to start. You're probably wondering, do I have to calculate the delegates? How do I know who got how many delegates coming out of these, uh, these contests? Unless you are a delegate counter, unless that is your job, and if it is, Godspeed to you, uh, you do not have to have responsibility for figuring that out. Um, most of you uh, will either get your delegates through one of two ways. Um, you may work for a news organization that has a dedicated delegate counting team. You should figure that out now, and you should become best friends with that person. Uh, they will help you not only on the nitty gritty of the numbers, but they will also really be helpful to you just in terms of uh, figuring out strategy for these campaigns. They'll be able to, they'll be talking to people like Jeff who are working for the campaigns uh, and trying to figure out how the campaigns are gonna be picking up the most number of delegates along the way. 
If you don't work for a news organization that does your own delegate count, you probably are relying on the Associated Press delegate count. Uh, we have a really experienced team that's been doing this for a long time. They are deep in the weeds on this. We make all of that information public. Uh, how will you find that? If your news organization is an AP member, you will see us filing stories uh, on the delegate counts. We also will be putting them out uh, on our Twitter account, AP Politics, and also on APnews.com. We don't keep any of this secret. It's publicly available information. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind as we talk through the calendar is that the delegate count can change. So you want to be you want to be uh, checking back. Uh, there are a lot of situations that Jeff can probably talk about where you get through the Iowa caucuses or maybe the Nevada caucuses and a, a candidate is declared the winner of the caucuses, but actually the delegate count is either tied or uh, the the candidate that didn't necessarily win the overall vote total actually gets more delegates. We've seen that happen a couple of times. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, uh, sure. Uh, in 2008 in Nevada, uh, which was a key uh, contest, the third contest, and so Obama wins Iowa. Hillary Clinton wins New Hampshire. What's going to happen next is sort of the battle of these two titans. And uh, Nevada was essentially sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat in a caucus setting. And uh, as it turned out, Hillary's strength was consolidated in Clark County, which is Las Vegas. And uh, Obama's strength was more in the outlying areas of the state. And it just turned out that there was one district out in the outlying areas that had an odd number of delegates. And so the fact that Obama won, had the majority in that district between the two candidates, he not only got one delegate plus one delegate or the even number, but he got that last odd one. And so because of his strength in this one particular district, uh, whereas down in, uh, in the Las Vegas area, it was more even numbered districts. So they, they were still pretty close in contention, even though Hillary was doing better. So we split those delegates. So just then, as the way the numbers fell, we ended up with that uh, extra odd delegate if you were to continue through the process. Because remember, the first round of voting was precinct level in a caucus system. And then uh, they elect people to county conventions, delegates to county conventions, and those delegates elected delegates to a state convention, but the proportions between the candidates pretty much stay about the same as you move up uh, the chain. And so the bottom line was she won more delegates from the precincts to the county level, but they were clustered in districts that had even numbers of delegates where we were going to end up splitting them. And Obama had this advantage by being more successful where there was an odd number of delegates to win. Uh, it produced a very interesting result because AP called uh, the state for Hillary based on the fact that she won more precinct delegates. But the reality was that if those numbers held, Obama was going to send more delegates to the national convention. So we disputed the call. And We're reminded of that frequently. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and they changed the call and, uh, and noted that Obama actually would win more delegates. It was just sort of an important engagement right before South Carolina, which was the last state prior to Super Tuesday when those 1,681 delegates would be at play. So it was a very important call. Uh, and it prevented Hillary from winning two states in a row and having any kind of momentum out of it. And you'll hear this a lot in Iowa as well after 2016, where Bernie Sanders will talk about tying in delegates, uh, even though uh, the Clinton campaign says they won the Iowa caucuses. It was 40, uh, it was very close, 48.6 to 48.4 percent. Iowa was by a hair uh, in 2016 for Hillary, uh, you know, in those precinct level delegates. But, yeah. So one of the other things that you want to keep in mind, and, and Jeff I pointed this out here, but I just want to really emphasize this, is uh, the what the early states mean in terms of delegates versus momentum, and then what the Super Tuesday states actually mean there. So obviously, a lot of you are going to be spending a ton of time in Iowa, South Carolina, New Hampshire, and Nevada. 
those states are really crucial for momentum, but they are not necessarily crucial for delegates. And it's really important in your coverage that you reflect this. Momentum is important. I don't want you to misunderstand that. Momentum is what signals to people in the later states that you can win. It signals to, if you come out of South Carolina as a, a strong contender, it means that you have strength within the African-American community, which is really crucial for the Democratic primary. If you have strength in Nevada, it probably means that you're strong with Hispanic voters, another really important voting block. But it is almost impossible, uh, it is impossible, I think Jeff would probably say, to come out of those states with enough of a delegate lead that you can actually block out the rest of the field. Uh, the Giuliani strategy is maybe not a good example of, of trying to get out of there without some, some delegates or momentum, but it's really Super Tuesday where we start to get into the place where you can see a candidate separate from the rest of the field. Uh, there are so many delegates at stake that uh, conceivably, you can gain so much of a lead that the next closest person can't catch up. And that's where we were in both 08 and in 16, if you want to talk yeah. about that a bit. Yeah, uh, I do. Super Tuesday is an important state, right, when it comes to delegates. You remember uh, there's 1,457 that look like they're going to be on the board uh, this time. As I said, that number could change a little bit because there's still some uh, possible movement in dates. They're not all completely settled. but it changes from cycle to cycle. So I mentioned in 2008 there were 1,681 delegates uh, in 23 states, and uh, in in 2000 and uh, in 2016 it went down to 11 states. So it went from 23 states to 11 states, and now it's back up to 16 states. So don't think of the 2016 experience as the template for what 2020 will be. This will actually be more like 2008. And um, the, the other thing is that the sort of, the overall kind of character of Super Tuesday has changed so that in 2008, it was a pretty broad national contest. It included California, New York, New Jersey. I mean, it, it really spread across the country. In 2016, it was a much more southern focused contest. And that put the African American vote more in, in importance uh, because of the population demographics in those states. In 2020, it's expanding back out again into a more national and a less southern focused contest. Um, and we're going to have California back in the mix like they were in 08. They were not there in 16. Um, but New York and New Jersey still are not likely to be there the, in 2020 as they were in 2008. So I would just say don't look you know, strictly at a previous cycle, any previous cycle, as the exact template. But there are lessons always to be drawn uh, from previous results. Can you talk about the likelihood in a field like this, which is going to be so large on the Democratic side, the likelihood of somebody coming out of Super Tuesday with so much of a delegate lead that it's almost impossible for someone to catch up, even if other candidates stay in the race? Because that's where we were in 08 and yeah. 16. There's many ways a presidential race can go. If you think back to 2004, which is not that long ago, John Kerry won Iowa, he won New Hampshire, and he never lost uh, a contest afterwards. Sometimes a candidate can get some important back-to-back -back victories early and develop a, mom a momentum that does knock other candidates out of the race and confirms the strength of that candidate. And at this point, I would not venture to say, you know, how 2020 is going to go. Are we going to have a candidate who over the course of this year becomes dominant, or will it stay as a very competitive contest into the early states and through the early states. Remember, there are only uh, so many uh, candidates who can break the 15% threshold mathematically. And I've told you in Iowa, it has only been three. And so um, there is a natural uh, tendency of the system to narrow the field down. and. Uh, the field, but you don't know whether it's going to be narrowed to two candidates, to three candidates. Um, and, and it has not always been two candidates. I mean, we're all thinking 2008, Clinton, Obama, 2016, Clinton, Sanders, those were person to person races. There have been times in the past where more candidates have 
uh, going on. And, and I mentioned before, if you look at regionality, sometimes certain regions will vote for their candidates. And, and the demographic appeal, uh, sometimes there's certain constituencies that will vote for their candidate. They may not even be certain the candidate can win, but they still want to vote for them. They're still earning delegates. And so that's really going to determine uh, how many candidates get through this process and survive into the back end uh, and, you know, and have a chance on getting to the 51%. And one of the reasons, as I mentioned at the start, that you want to become best friends with whoever is the, the delegate tracker at your news organization or where, why you want to really have a pretty deep understanding of this process is because when we get through Super Tuesday, you start getting to the place where in your coverage, you need to start making editorial decisions about how you're describing the field. Uh, if you're going to start describing somebody as a likely nominee, uh, as the front runner, as the presumptive nominee, you know those are questions. Those are dis decisions you want to make with the math behind you. You want to be able to have a discussion with your editors, with your uh, with your delegate counters about how many delegates are left on the table, what the prospects are that somebody would be able to catch up to whoever is leading that total. Uh, those aren't decisions that you should make on your own. They're not decisions. That, uh, that you should make lightly because they mean a lot. They signal to voters that, that either this race is over, uh, even though it looks like it's going to go on for a long time, but the math tells us it's essentially over, or that it's not, or that this is still really wide open. So again, really understanding um, how this process will play out, particularly when we get through Super Tuesday, is really crucial to your coverage. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about quickly, um, because everyone asks me about this a lot, and I'm sure you as well, Jeff, is superdelegates. Uh, so this is one of those areas that has really changed uh, um, from 2016, superdelegates uh, in previous elections, these are these are party insiders, uh, party officials who get to make a decision on who they want to support based on their own personal preference. Uh, and AP, uh, somewhat famously in 2016, uh, was able to call the Democratic primary for Hillary Clinton before the final primary in California based on support of superdelegates. And the way that we were able to do that is that we had a team of people that was literally calling the superdelegates throughout the primary process saying, hey, are you supporting Clinton? Are you supporting Sanders? Where are you on this? Uh, and the night before the California primary, uh, a superdelegate put Clinton over the top, and so we called the race at that point. Um, it was a bit controversial with some Sanders supporters, as you can imagine, but the numbers were there, and it was our job to to call the race when it was when it was done. Uh, that's not going to happen this time around. The superdelegates only will come into play if we get into a situation where there's a contested convention, if we go to a second ballot. Uh, that changes the process for news organizations like the AP and some of your news organizations in terms of how we're going to be tracking those superdelegates, just the importance of of, of uh, making sure we have a sense of where they go. But I'm hoping Jeff, before we go to some questions from the audience, can talk a little bit about the decision-making process to, to change the role of superdelegates. Well, it, it, the, the question of the role of superdelegates has been controversial for certainly since 2008. It was an issue in that campaign. Uh, we in the Obama campaign were encouraging the superdelegates at the time to vote in accordance with the results of the national delegate contest. Don't basically have the delegates elected by the voters in the primaries and caucuses um, uh, be overruled, essentially, by uh, an opposing decision of the superdelegates going for the second place candidate. So that was, uh, and, and they did not. And there was, in the end, there was no controversy in how the superdelegates voted. Um, over time, they came over to Obama, although originally uh, Hillary Clinton had a lead among the superdelegates. The fact was that the vast majority of them early on were staying uncommitted and watching the race. They're free to make their decision at any time, so they can wait. Some, some wait, some don't wait. Some don't wait because they want to be involved and be an active member of a particular campaign. Um, and in that case, uh, you know, they know at the very beginning who they're going to support. So, uh, but as I said, in this cycle, in 2020, uh, the superdelegates are not voting on the first ballot. Um, and that does change, um, you know, the potential for different kinds of outcomes because if you think about it, if we have three or more candidates in the delegate race going through the primaries, it's hard to get to 51% when you're splitting the shares three ways. 
in the past, maybe if, you, if the leader got to 45% or somewhere in that range, the superdelegates could put them over the top. So you still have the plurality leader being the nominee. This time, on the first ballot, they're not going to be available. There will be no superdelegates voting on the first ballot. So if you don't get to 51% on the first ballot, then if, I should say, if, if the leader, the plurality leader, does not get to 51%, then it's not going to be decided on the first ballot. I can encourage you to uh, step up to the mic and ask questions. And while you line up, let me ask Jeff quickly, uh, the scenario you just talked about which is essentially a contested convention. Is this just the pipe dream of uh, delegate nerds and political journalists, or is this, is this a possible scenario in a field that's this crowded? Well, I, it, it is a possible scenario, but every four years, it's always a possible scenario. So I would say this time with the superdelegates out of the mix on the first ballot, that you know that certainly affects the chances for, for the outcome. But it still only happens in, in particular circumstances, right? If, if a candidate takes off, has true momentum, uh, they will probably find their way to the 51%. All right. Go ahead, sir. Uh, good morning, Andy Shane. I'm with the uh, Post and Courier in Charleston, South Carolina. So obviously have a big interest in what's happening in the early states. I want to get your thoughts on the impact of Super Tuesday happening right after South Carolina. So as comparison, Super Tuesday was 10 days after South Carolina and only accounted for about half of the delegates. Now we're talking about three days and almost two thirds of the current delegate count. So essentially, do you imagine that possibly in South Carolina we're going to see maybe less of the candidates as they go to the Super Tuesday states because it's happening 72 hours after the, after the uh, uh, votes are cast in South Carolina? Well, I think um, different presidential candidates will approach that question differently. And those who feel that they have a very strong chance in South Carolina are obviously going to work it very hard. Uh, others may look to other states uh, to some degree for, for delegates because there's so many delegates available on Super Tuesday. But again, skipping states, uh, especially crucial early states, is usually not a good formula. Um, so m my guess is that the most competitive candidates will be very focused on uh, South Carolina when it, when it comes up. I mean, this is the problem with front loading of the calendar. That's the term we use when all of the states, not all, when many states, in this case 16 states, all group on the same date. How is a presidential candidate to campaign in those states and reach and communicate with those voters? And uh, you could do, obviously, some work during this calendar year in the period prior to the intensity of the early states. But uh, it's really, as a practical matter, very difficult. Sometimes uh, presidential candidates will just fly around from state to state, get out of the plane, have a con press conference in the state, in the media market, get back in the plane, and just try and hit as many markets as possible. But it really isn't the best way to run a railroad if what you're trying to do is enable candidates to communicate with voters. And that's why we have those incentives, which I mentioned before, of adding bonus delegates for states that will not move to the front. And, um, but it, it's, we, we leave those decisions up to each state to make their own decision. Has, oh. yeah. Let's go to the mic, because we had a long line here. Go ahead, sir. Has uh, New Hampshire Secretary of State Bill Gardner signed off on this calendar? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, you noted up there that I did not have, uh, actually should have put possible under the New Hampshire date because uh, I don't believe there has been any formal decision. The Secretary of State of New Hampshire, uh, Gardner, usually waits until late in the process to make his uh, firm uh, decision on what the date of New Hampshire will be. The four early dates are the dates that the national parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, have adopted. I know there have been discussions among the early states, including New Hampshire, about the, that ordering and those specific dates. And so far, I'm not aware of any hiccups. But Secretary of State Gardner waits because some other state could maybe move. And uh, 
we have been able in the last couple of cycles to more or less eliminate the uh, leapfrogging of states into the early period. That, that is, the states other than the four early approved ones, other st states coming in. That was a big issue in 2008. You may remember Michigan and Florida had moved into that early period that is reserved for those four states. And the DNC took very strong action and stripped those states of all of their delegates, Florida and Michigan, in 2008. They were ultimately restored, but only after the nominating contest was over, just so they could attend the convention. Um, but I mean, so the short answer to your question is, the Secretary of State of New Hampshire does not make his final decision until late in this process. A lot of the state parties are still submitting their dates and their plans to the DNC, which will review them over the summer. And until this process is done, I don't think you'll see an official edict from the Secretary of State. But I'm not sure. I don't expect personally that you, you know there would be a problem. Will one the reason I ask that is that the change that the Iowa people are making in their reporting the raw body count is what will cause him heartburn because it looks too much like a, a primary. Uh, do you have any thoughts about how candidates are going to approach this, the virtual absentee ballot primary? And do you have any thoughts about what it means to the coverage? Uh, if, if the party reports a raw body count on caucus night, that's the number all of us are going to be reporting. I mean, to hell with this de delegate equivalent stuff. Nobody can understand that anyway. And if the party does not choose to do that, then we can report how Bernie Sanders people go ballistic. Uh, do you have any thoughts about sure. this? Sure. Yeah, this contest is still predominantly a caucus. And Iowa has also taken a step that only, uh, while they're going to have some an absentee voting mechanism, that only 10% of their delegates will be allocated through an, any early voting type mechanism. So 90% of the delegates will be allocated by the traditional Iowa caucus, where people show up divide in the room, count heads, figure out what the percentage is for each presidential candidate, and then pick delegates in those percentages to go to their county convention. It's the way Iowa has done it in the past. It'll still be done that way. And so, yes, they're going to report the raw total, but they're also going to report the delegate totals. And uh, given the totality of that plan that is still predominantly, heavily predominantly a caucus, uh, hopefully it will pass muster with the Secretary of State. And just in terms of coverage, again, it's really important to remember through this whole process that there are a lot of ways that campaigns can spin strengths uh, or their opponent's weaknesses through these contests. The thing that matters is the delegate count. That's the way that Democrats pick their nominee. So regardless of everything else, that's what you really need to stay focused on. Go ahead. Hi. Oh, hi. Samantha Sergi from ABC News. My question is more about the debate um, and how y'all are going to choose who is participating in the debate. Do you find any potential problems with using a 1% margin in polls? Uh, you know, me personally, I, I don't find any problem with it. Uh, I don't see a particular problem. that We have the two methods now. If you can't get to 1%, which is not a very high percent, it's just one, uh, we actually have an alternative method. If you have true grassroots support through your fundraising uh, mechanism uh, to show that you're, you're entitled to that stage. So I don't see any problem. Um, a follow-up on that, polls are notoriously not correct early on, so there's no even how polls can have different methodology and the questions, is there a standard of what people are doing for those polls that you guys are gonna use or is it all just different uh, methodologies yeah. and, and I, analysts? Yeah. That's a good question. I, I believe that the party has uh, put out a list of all of the major polling organizations whose polls are considered to be uh, you know, scientific, reliable, first rate, and so it would be polls from one of those polling organizations. Thank you. See, we have a newbie reporter here coming yes, up with a question. I, I could do this all day. Thank you for doing this panel. 
love geeking out on this stuff. I want to ask a question because Julie, you, you brought a really a, a really good point, which is it is the delegates that matter, but the perception also matters. And we had one candidate in 2016, Bernie Sanders, mathematically was out of the game long before the process ended, but stayed in the game, and many of his supporters mm -hmm. thought the game was rigged. I'm wondering if you could address any concerns you may have that that could happen once again, that candidates can stay in the field, continue to get delegates, but once we get to the end game, they feel as if the process, you know, their, their case hasn't been properly made, we get to the, the uh, convention, and there's still this sense that it's difficult to unify the party because candidates now stayed in throughout, even mathematically, uh, exempt candidates. Yeah, uh, well, for, for my purposes, we had a bit of the same issue in 2008, yeah. uh, where we on the Obama team had wished that Secretary Clinton would have uh, acknowledged the Obama nomination a little earlier than she did. Uh, obviously, she felt the same way. It's somehow a little bit of irony, perhaps, there uh, in 2016. Um, and what happens in 2020, again, is just completely unknowable. Uh, the hope for Democrats always is that the party will unify, that the voters will come together and support the nominee. That's the, in the modern national convention, that is a focus of what the convention is about. And uh, Senator Sanders did call for a unanimous uh, nomination of Hillary Clinton in 2016. Uh, as we had worked out in 2008, uh, where Hillary supported that process for a unanimous vote by the delegates, by acclamation for Barack Obama. And so, uh, but, you know, you, you have to win the hearts and minds of the voters. Uh, it's not just a decision made, uh, in that case, by Senator Sanders, but we need to reach all of the Sanders voters, uh, you know, to coalesce in the fall. So and do you think the superdelegate change will help with that? Yes, and I think this process, there is a more mindfulness at this point, I think, by Tom Perez and the leadership of the DNC to produce a process that uh, all Democrats will feel good about. And, and you saw the, the rules for the debates. It's, there's just a much bigger focus on giving all the candidates a fair opportunity so that um, no candidate or their supporters will feel that they were somehow disadvantaged. This again is why it's really important for all of you to understand this process because there could end up being a point in this race where a candidate who's still in the field and has money and supporters is mathematically eliminated from becoming the nominee. And, and it's important for, for the public's awareness that we make that really clear in our coverage. But you also have to be able to explain why that's the case because you will have people, supporters of that, those candidates, asking you in person when you're on the trail, asking you on social media, so why do you keep saying this? Why do you keep saying this? And you have to have a pretty clear answer for why that's the case. And, and just, just to follow on that, if we have three or more candidates with a significant amount of delegates, it's, the question is not only do I have enough delegates realistically to get to 51%, but it's do any of my opponents have enough delegates to 51% because why will I withdraw when no one else uh, is necessarily within reach or easy reach of that number? So, you know, I would think that those candidates will stay in. But, you know, again, this all speculation as to how it'll go. All right, we just have a few more minutes. Let's try to get through the last couple questions here. You talked about the party making a big push to encourage states to move to primaries instead of caucuses, and that there were some significant changes with how states were going to run um, their, their voting. But obviously, there's these two huge exceptions uh, in the first four states to caucuses. In your opinion, did the party adequately consider changing which four states would be able to go first by using some big carrot or stick? And what do you think about the fact that we still have these two caucuses in those first four states? Yeah, good question. So as I mentioned before, Iowa and New Hampshire have been going first, one and two, for a long time. And there has been an understanding 
that uh, Iowa would go in front of New Hampshire, as was mentioned uh, before, because it is a caucus state, and New Hampshire law uh, authorizes the Secretary of State to be the first uh, primary vote in the country. So with Iowa being a caucus, New Hampshire and Iowa you know, sort of reached a, uh, a, an understanding that Iowa would go first um, but would be a different kind of a voting system, a caucus system. Um, and then uh, two or three cycles ago, there was a desire among the states and the national party to broaden the early voting, not just to have those two be the only true early states. And we had literally a competition, and we let all the states apply to join that early window that we call it actually the pre-window because the window opens on Super Tuesday when all the states can choose their own date. And so many states applied and the ones that were selected were Nevada and South Carolina. The DNC was looking for regional diversity. We wanted to get to other parts of the country and that's the South and the West. We we're looking for demographic diversity. We wanted to see other uh, Democratic voting constituencies ref reflected strongly in the four early state voting. So that's why we picked those two. So that got us to the four. And then the Republican Party agreed to the same four. So we actually were be able to bring order from what in previous cycles sometimes had been calendar chaos, where states were just jumping all over each other regardless of the rules. So we now have a system where basically uh, the both the ma major national parties and the states around the country understand we have four diverse early states. How long that will stay, you know, how long we'll hold this order remains to be seen, but it hasn't been very long. So, uh, it, you know, we now have order. And order is important because Candidates need to know when the primaries and caucuses are going to be held. I can tell you in 2008, when Michigan and Florida were uh, butting right into when uh, New Hampshire and the other states were voting, that the New Hampshire Secretary of State was threatening to move his state farther forward to get in front of the states that were impinging on, his, on, on New Hampshire's date and there was the threat they may even go into the previous calendar year, which would be the equivalent of New Hampshire voting this December. And then, of course, Iowa would have moved in front of them, and uh, we would so have we're been... voting in the summer. Exactly. We would be voting soon after Thanksgiving. And so I can very well remember, and, and David may remember this, uh, but David Pluff asking me, when am I going to know when the votes are going to be held. You know, you've got to buy TV, you've got to plan your staff, everything. There was instability in the, in the calendar and in the voting order. So what we have achieved is actually an accomplishment. So we don't necessarily need to bust it up right away. It's, it's actually of benefit uh, to have stability. So since we are the only thing standing between lunch, do you... <laughs> Well, that, that's a good question. Obviously, competing in all of these contests costs money. And um, in 2008, one of the reasons for the success of the Obama campaign was that we had carefully managed the budget and we had reserved funding for Super Tuesday. And we had even reserved funding for the contests immediately following Super Tuesday. If you go back and look at the voting results on Super Tuesday, the delegate results, it was 847 for Obama and 834 for Hillary. It was virtually a tie. So the national delegate fight was just totally uh, 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 almost like a stalemate at that point. But we had identified the next two weeks there were 11 contests over the following Saturdays and Tuesdays. And 
We had identified those as favorable to Obama, and the campaign reserved funding so that we could go up and do the spending we needed to do in those states, even starting before Super Tuesday and certainly after Super Tuesday and the days immediately before those votes. And that made the difference because in terms of the Clinton campaign, they ran out of money on Super Tuesday. And as I understand, Hillary Clinton had a mortgage, place a mortgage on her home to get some funding in for their most essential spending. We had a reserve of millions of dollars for that. And so you definitely need to have a budget. You need to know how to plan your spending. And you need to have the funds. And this is a cycle with a lot of candidates. And they're spreading. Uh, and they will be splitting the Democratic fundraising base up every which way, right? And so before, we only had two candidates in that cycle. And even in 16, well, not two, but we had two major candidates. And, and the same in 16. And now with candidates splitting up uh, Democratic donations so many different ways, uh, it will be a challenge for the candidates to individually raise the kind of money that the campaigns raised in these last two competitive cycles. And if you look at the numbers, you'll see um, you know, that money was raised at a higher level in those cycles. There were only two candidates to divide up sort of the Democratic financial base around the country, whether online or traditional larger donors. Um, the fact is they're going to be split a lot of different ways now, and the campaigns will be pressed to build up the reserve uh, to spend on those states. And a lot of that also goes to what is your burn rate, right? So throughout this calendar year, if you are carrying heavy expenses, you're eating up a lot of the money that you're raising. So what do you have when the time comes for the actual voting? So now you can blame David for making you late to lunch. But it's his conference, so it's his prerogative. Uh, we are going to have to wrap it up here. I'm sure Jeff is available to answer any questions. Um, I am as well. And thank you very much for joining us.